Final talk of the day is uh, Kurt Hinterbickler from Case Western. Oops, hold on a minute. Okay, he's going to tell us about uh, conformal symmetry of DBI and special Galileo. Thank you, Kurt. Okay, great. So thank you, David, for organizing this nice conference and for giving me the opportunity to speak. So I'm going to talk about work that's hopefully going to come out soon with uh, our new postdoc at Case Western, Kara Farnsworth and Andra Hulik. So this is about uh, hidden symmetries in the DBI theory and the special Galilean theory. So as cosmologists, we're often interested in theories, effective field theories that have just a single scalar degree of freedom. And among such theories, there are two exceptional theories that have the softest possible behavior of the amplitudes. And those are the DBI theory and the special Galilean theory. So many of you are already familiar with these, uh, these theories. So the DBI theory has this famous square root structure. And the special Galilean is a particular one of the Galilean theories where all the coefficients are fixed relative to each other, but uh, in terms of a single coupling. So both of these theories have a single coupling constant alpha and are otherwise completely fixed. So this is a nice picture that I stole from this paper uh, here. And what you have on the vertical axis is derivatives per field. So this is a classification of effective field theories of a single scalar. And on the horizontal axis, you have this soft scaling limit so that as you take the external momenta of the amplitude to zero, the amplitudes go to zero with some power of the external momenta and what you see plotted is the power. So if you have enough derivatives per field, this scaling behavior is all, always kind of trivial. So that's this blue region here where the soft behavior is kind of what you expect from the number of derivatives. But if you're away from this blue region, then you've got non-trivial cancellations that are happening to make the soft limit better. So there's only two theories that are away from this blue region when we have a single scalar and that's this DBI theory here and the special Galilean theory here. So you can think of this exceptional soft behavior as due to, uh, it's a consequence essentially of extended shift symmetries that these theories have. So DBI has an extended shift symmetry, which goes like a single power of the space-time coordinate X along with nonlinear terms. And the special Galilean has an extended shift symmetry that goes like two powers of the space-time coordinate along with nonlinear stuff. Let's see, my slides are not. There we go. Okay, so let's start with the DBI theory. So it's got this square root action. If we expand it, we get all the various terms, a P of X like terms with coefficients that are fixed in a square root structure. So it's a relativistic theory. It has standard Poincare invariance, the translations and the Lorentz transformations. The scalar field has a canonical mass dimension, D minus two over two, which means that the coupling constant in generic dimension D has uh, engineering dimension minus minus D. So we can notice if we start thinking about this theory in non-physical space-time dimensions, suppose we think of the theory in dimension zero, then this coupling constant becomes dimensionless uh, and the scalar field in that dimension has, has a weight minus one. And so this, the theory is actually becoming scale invariant in space-time dimension zero, which means that it has as a symmetry, this dilation transformation. So this is the standard dilation transformation for a field of weight minus one. And you can show explicitly that this is a symmetry of the theory. If you vary the Lagrangian, it will vary up to terms that are proportional to D. So when D equals zero, it's, it's formally a symmetry. Uh, in some sense, it's trivial because each of these terms in the expansion of the square root is separately invariant under this symmetry, just like it's uh, separately invariant under the Lorentz transformations. Okay. A few months ago, there was this paper by Cliff Chung and collaborators, which was interesting because they argued that the DBI theory at dimension D equals zero actually is fully conformally invariant. So not only does it have the scale symmetry, but it has special conformal symmetry and that only the DBI theory has this symmetry. So it's actually non-trivial. It's fixing the square root structure. So they showed this by showing that the stress tensor could be improved to be traceless when D is equal to zero and that the amplitudes satisfy the standard uh, momentum space uh, ward identities that you get from special conformal transformations. Okay, but this raises a puzzle about what the uh, actual form of the symmetry is. So a generic P of X theory would would be scale invariant automatically in D equals zero, but not conformally invariant. So they argued that only DBI is conformally invariant, that that's 
something special about this square root structure. So the, it means that the special conformal symmetries have to be somehow fixing this square root structure. However, the usual form of special conformal transformations is still linear. This is the form of, in a standard conformal field theory of what the special conformal transformations look like. So because it's linear, it can't actually fix the square root structure. It can't relate terms of higher order in the field to terms of lower order in the field. So it means that in, the, in this case here, a special conformal symmetry has to be different. It has to be nonlinearly realized somehow. On the other hand, when we talk about nonlinearly realized symmetries, we often have in mind spontaneously broken symmetries. But here we don't want it to be spontaneously broken because we want the standard word identities to be working for the amplitude. So we need a nonlinearly realized symmetry, which is not spontaneously broken. By the way, could, may, may, may I ask you a question? Yeah. Hi. Uh, I have a very simple question. So do they uh, take into account only normal uh, humane DBI or also the superluminal DBI? It's, it, it works for both. It works for both. Yeah, Great. and I'll, I'll say more about that in a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is the form of this conformal symmetry? So the form that we found that works, that's actually a symmetry, looks like this. So it's got a linear term that looks like the normal conformal transformation, but now it has this nonlinear term, which is proportional to the coupling constant alpha. And it has no term that's independent of the field. So it means that the, it's nonlinearly realized because of this nonlinear term, but it's still not spontaneously broken because the special conformal transformations are preserving the vacuum phi equals zero. So you can show explicitly that this is a symmetry of the DBI action when D equals zero and, it, and this nonlinear term fixes the square root structure. So now you can start, you, you should ask whether these things satisfy the same kind of commutation relations that we're used to in conformal symmetry. And the answer is yes, these special conformal transformations with the nonlinear terms still satisfy the same conformal algebra as the usual linear transformations. So the commutators are all independent of alpha and the conformal group is the same group SO2 comma D that you get for any conformal field theory. So just as a reminder, you, you can see that the conformal group is SO2 comma D by grouping the conformal generators into this anti-symmetric matrix JAB of dimension D plus two. And then if you define this, this D plus two dimensional metric with two times here, GAB, the commutators can be written in this SO form, which shows that the conformal group is SO2 comma D. Okay, so the DBI theory also famously has these extended shift symmetries. So there's two kinds of shift symmetries. There's the boring shift symmetry, which just shifts the field by a constant, which would be present for any P of X theory. Uh, but then there's the exciting shift symmetry that goes linearly in X and has these nonlinear pieces, which is present only for the square root structure. So now we should ask how do these shift symmetries interplay with the conformal symmetry? And in fact, they don't close. So if you compute, for example, the commutator of the special conformal generator with that new nonlinear term, along with the exciting shift symmetry, you find that there's a new shift symmetry that's present. It's a scalar shift symmetry that goes like X squared. So it's quadratic in the space-time coordinate and also has this nonlinear stuff. And this also is a symmetry of the DBI action when D is equal to zero. So for example, you can see if the coupling were equal to zero, uh, this transformation would just be a shift by X squared and the DBI action would just be the ordinary kinetic term. And you can see that the kinetic term, if I vary it, by, a, by an X squared, usually we don't think of this as a symmetry, but the variation is actually proportional to D. And so it vanishes when D equals zero. So this is a symmetry of the free scalar when D equals zero. Okay, so now once we include this new shift symmetry, all the generators close. So here's a list of all the commutators of the shift symmetries with the conformal symmetries. When you commutate a shift symmetry and a conformal symmetry, you get back uh, another shift symmetry. So the shift symmetries are transforming in a representation of the conformal group. So they transform as expected under the Lorentz transformations as their index structure would indicate. They are eigenvalues under the dilation transformation with eigenvalues one, zero, minus one. And then they transform among each other under the P's and K's. So the P's and K's are kind of like raising and lowering operators. So we can illustrate this 
like so. So this is a, a representation of the conformal algebra, a Verma module that's finite dimensional. So N here, the new shift symmetry is kind of like a ground state. Uh, and it has a dilation dimension minus one, and then we can go up to the shift symmetries and down by acting with P and K. So this, as a representation of a conformal group, this is some D plus two dimensional representation. The group is SO2 comma D. This is nothing but the vector representation of SO2 comma D. So we can group together these shift symmetries into a D plus two dimensional vector like so. And then the commutation relations between the conformals and these shifts satisfy just the standard uh, uh, commutator telling you that S is a vector. Now, if we look at the commutators of the shifts among themselves, they always bring you back to a conformal generator with a proportionality of alpha, the coupling. And these commutators can be summarized like this. Okay, so what, what is this group? taken all together, we can identify the full group by grouping the conformals and the shifts together into a D plus three dimensional anti-symmetric matrix like so, and define this D plus three dimensional metric. And then the commutators all become SO of this SO form. So the full algebra we can recognize as just SOD comma, SO2 comma D plus one. So it's the conformal algebra of one higher dimension. Okay, so that should make one suspicious that this conformal symmetry is perhaps coming from the bulk point of view when you think about the DBI theory as like a brain theory embedded in a, in a higher dimensional bulk. Sorry, Kurt, uh, Sad just raised yeah. his hand. I think he has a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I thought that maybe asking this earlier is better than later. So when you say D equals zero and you still keep track of this indices mu, I, I mean, I have a hard, hard time understanding what you're doing actually. So I, yeah, I, I know yeah. that people have talked about this before, but it's just my ignorance. Yeah, yeah, so formally you just, when you're doing all this, you work at general D and, and only at the end you set D equal to zero. So you don't use, it's like in dimensional regularization. So you don't use any dimensional dependent identities and you don't, and you just, so you, you mean that when, when you compute something like amplitudes, you, you compute the amplitude as a function of D and then you set D yeah. equals zero. Oh, okay. That's right, yeah. Yeah, thanks. So you don't kill any vector indices or anything like that. Mm -hmm. so, sorry, just to follow up, but then this uh, conformal symmetry that's nonlinear, it, it's only a symmetry at D is equal to zero, right? That's right. So, so I, I, at different D, this, this symmetry group is, so is, not, is not a well, symmetry. So actually the commutators and everything work for arbitrary D. It just mm -hmm. only is a symmetry of the DBI action when D equals zero. Okay, thanks. Kurt, and what would you do if uh, uh, this alpha is negative? So then it cannot take the square root. So then yeah, it's good. So yeah, so I should, yeah. So if alpha is negative, then in fact you need a minus sign in the lower corner of this metric and then the group would become SO3 comma D. So it's mm -hmm. just a different, different signature of the group. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, so the symmetry breaking pattern here is that the, the shifts are all broken, the conformal symmetry is unbroken. So the symmetry breaking pattern is SOD to, uh, SO2D plus one down to SO2D. So it's breaking a higher dimensional conformal symmetry down to a lower dimensional one, which happens to be the same symmetry breaking pattern as an ADS DBI theory in one dimension higher. Okay, so this should make us suspicious that we can understand these symmetries from a brain point of view. So as we know, we can construct the DBI theory as a brain theory. So we imagine that there's some D dimensional world volume brain embedded in a D plus one dimensional bulk. So X, A here are the embedding coordinates. And then we can write down an action which is square root of the induced metric G bar, which is just the pullback of some fixed bulk metric G, A, B. And when we do this, there's always a gauge symmetry, which is the freedom to change coordinates on the world volume of the brain itself, which is um, under which these X's just transform as scalars. So the DBI action itself is recovered by fixing this gauge symmetry into a unitary gauge. So we, we set the first D X is equal to the world volume coordinates. And then the last one becomes the scalar field, which is just the brain bending mode. So if we have a bulk transformation now, some bulk diffeomorphism given by this bulk vector field K, 
if we want to see how this acts on the phi and unitary gauge, we have to do a gauge transformation to restore the unitary gauge after doing this bulk transformation. So you get this compensating gauge transformation. And then this is the form that the symmetry takes or, or the transformation acting on phi. Okay, so if this bulk vector field is a killing vector of the metric, so it leaves the, the fixed bulk metric invariant, then the induced metric is also invariant and we get a global symmetry of the DBI theory. So in this square root action that we're talking about, the bulk metric is just the flat metric and the bulk killing vectors are just the bulk Poincaré symmetries and the components of this along the brain lead to the Poincaré symmetries of the DBI theory. And then the extra dimensional components lead to the shift symmetry. So the translations into the extra dimension give the shift on the, the, sh the simple shift of the scalar. And then the boosts into the extra dimension give the, the exciting transformation of the scalar. Okay, but now let's think of what happens when this bulk vector field is a conformal killing vector. So it doesn't the, the lead derivative doesn't annihilate the bulk metric, but rather just leaves it unchanged up to some conformal factor, capital phi. So the induced metric now changes by some conformal factor, capital phi. So that means when we vary the square root action, when we, when we vary the square root determinant, we get a factor of d. So, the, so when d equals zero, the action is actually still formally invariant under the transformation by a conformal killing vector. So we can now look at what are the bulk Kill, the bulk conformal killing vectors, which are not ordinary killing vectors. So there's the bulk scale transformation. And when we put it through the, the unitary gauge formula, we recover exactly the, the, the dilation transformation with the correct weight of minus one for the scalar. And then there are the bulk special conformal transformations. And there are the ones along the brain. If we do the ones along the brain, we, we, rec uh, we recover the special conformal symmetries including the nonlinear term, which again, descends from this, this compensating gauge transformation you have to do. And then the one which is uh, away from the brain, the D plus one comp uh, killing, conformal killing vector, when we look at the transformation induced by that, it's the new symmetry that we called N. Okay, so this entire group of symmetries is nothing but conformal symmetries of bulk in which this brain is embedded which also shows that this symmetry is gonna to continue to be present if we have a bulk metric, which is ADS or, or et cetera, or something else. So the curved space DBI theories will also continue to have this, uh, this enhanced symmetry in zero dimensions. Okay, so we can also think about vial symmetry. So when we have a conformal field theory, we can generally couple it to a background metric in a way that the the conformal symmetry becomes local, it becomes a vial symmetry. So the traditional form of the vial symmetry is this, the metric changes by scaling with this vial factor sigma, which is a local, uh, it's a sigma of X. So it's a local gauge symmetry and the scalar field changes with uh, the weight delta times sigma. And in addition, since we've got a curved background metric now, we also have diffeomorphism invariance. So if we have a vial invariant theory, we recover the global uh, conformal field theory by going to flat space. And then the, the conformal symmetries descend from the, those vial plus diff symmetries, which preserve the flat space metric. So those are ones for which the diffeomorphism is a conformal killing vector and the vial factor is, is the gradient of the conformal killing vector. So the scale transformation, the scale conformal killing vectors give you uh, the scale transformation, the special conformal killing vectors give you the special conformal transformations. So we'd like to do the same with our new uh, uh, nonlinear conformal symmetry, but because it's nonlinear, we know that the vial transformation is also gonna have to be nonlinear. It's gonna have to be nonlinear on the scale, scalar. So we can find what this is order by order in alpha. So to lowest order in alpha, these are the most general nonlinear terms you could add to the vial transformation such that in the global limit, they reproduce the special conformal transformation with the nonlinear term that we had. Uh, there's two free coefficients here, A1 and A2. We can fix these by demanding that the vial transformations commute among themselves, just like the standard vial transformation does. Uh, we can then look for the action that's invariant. So we wanna add curvature type 
non-minimal couplings to the DBI theory in such a way that it has this vial symmetry. So at order alpha, these are the terms that you need. So there's one free coefficient B here, which goes in front of a vial square term, which is not fixed because the vial square term is invariant under the lowest order uh, scale transformation. So this would presumably be fixed at higher order or completed into some higher order vial invariant, which has this symmetry. Um, so we, we think that this can be extended to all orders, but we haven't managed to find an all orders expression yet. The terms that are linear in R match the terms in, in Cliff Chung et al's paper, which they used to improve the stress tensor to be traceless. But we notice that we also need R squared terms that they don't need for the flat space stress tensor, but that are necessary for the violent variance. Okay, so let me go on now to the special Galilean. So the special Galilean has now more derivatives per field, but it's still all completely fixed in terms of a single coupling constant. It's a sum of all the even powered Galilean terms with specific coefficients. It has standard Poincare symmetry again, and the field, uh, if we give it its canonical dimension, we, we learn that the coupling now has dimension minus d plus two. So now if we go to space-time dimension d equals minus two, the, the, the uh, theory becomes scale invariant. So again, the conformal symmetry is present and the form of the nonlinear transformation now looks like this. It has this nonlinear term with, with more derivatives per field now. And again, it satisfies the correct conformal algebra independently of alpha. Uh, so the conformal symmetry is still this SO2 comma D. The shift symmetries now have this uh, more complicated form. So we now have three shift symmetries. We still have the boring shift symmetry. We have the somewhat more exciting Galilean symmetry, which is, uh, which is a, a shift by X. And this would be present for any Galilean theory, regardless of the relative coefficients. But the special Galilean has this extended shift symmetry, which is present only when the relative coefficients are exactly of the special Galilean form. So now we can again start commuting these with the special with with the uh, the new conformal symmetries, and we uncover some new symmetries when we do this. So these don't compl uh, completely close with the conformal algebra. We have to add three new transformations before everything closes. So here's the new transformations. There's a new vector transformation A, and then two new scalar transformations T and N, and they go up to fourth order in the in the X. So N here is a fourth order transformation. Actually, it turns out that T, the T transformation here is not a symmetry, uh, but it always comes in the commutators with some factor of D plus two, so it never actually gets generated. But these other two are actual symmetries of the special Galilean when the dimension is minus two. So for example, if I look at, again at zeroth order at, in the coupling, where everything just reduces to the free scalar, when I shift by the zeroth order of this N here, the, uh, the free, scalar shifts into something proportional to d plus two. So when d is minus two, it all uh, it vanishes, then it's a symmetry. Okay, so here's now the, all the commutators of the, um, uh, of the shifts with the conformals. And again, they form a representation of the conformal group. So these new symmetries along with the original shift symmetries go together into a representation like this with conformal weights that span from minus two to two. And again, P and K are like raising and lowering operators that take you among all of these things. So now as a representation of SO2 comma D, we can recognize this Verma module as a symmetric traceless tensor representation of the conformal group. So we can group all of these new shift symmetries and the original shift symmetries into a symmetric traceless rank two tensor of dimension d plus two, like so. And then these commutators are all summarized by this expression here, which just is the statement that S transforms as a tensor under the conformal algebra. Now the commutators of the shifts with themselves, again, come take you back to conformal generators with some power of alpha. And those are summarized by this commutator here. So what algebra is this? So we have the anti-symmetric conformal generators and we have this traceless symmetric set of shift generators. We can group those together into a matrix M, which is now just a 
traceless matrix with no, which is neither symmetric nor anti-symmetric. And the, all the commutators now simplify into this nice simple expression, which is nothing but the commutation relations of SL D plus two. So the full algebra of this theory is SL D plus two. Here again, I've assumed that alpha is greater than zero. If alpha is less than zero, it would be some other real form of SL D plus two. So the symmetry breaking pattern now is all the shifts are again broken, the conformals are unbroken. So we've got symmetry breaking from SL D plus two down to the conformal SO2 comma D. And this is the same symmetry breaking pattern as the special Galilean theory on ADS space in one dimension higher. So we'd, what, one thing we're, we'd like is to have some geometric interpretation of where this is coming from. So several people like uh, Dietrich and Devadi have, pr have proposed uh, um, geometric interpretations of the special Galileo. It would be nice to see how this, how it generalizes to include these. Okay, so I'll, I'll summarize. So the DBI and the special Galileans, they have this enhanced conformal symmetry in these unphysical space-time dimensions. And the, it's an unusual type of conformal symmetry and that the special conformal generators are non-linearly realized even though the conformal symmetry is still unbroken. So we identified what these conformal symmetries are and found the lowest order vial transformations. Um, the, the big open question that I'd like to pursue is, is whether this conformal symmetry could be at all useful to bootstrap these theories. So there's a lot of technology now that's been developed around the conformal bootstrap. And so if that could be just, you know, set D equal to zero and all those bootstrap equations and, and try to import that uh, into DBI, it's not straightforward because of the fact that this conformal symmetry here is non-linearly realized, whereas all the bootstrap stuff relies on the usual linear, uh, linearly realized conformal symmetries. So one thing, I mean, one thing I would hope for is that maybe there are local operators in this theory that are complicated functions of the phi that, that nevertheless transform as conformal primaries. Uh, we couldn't find any such operators. It's, it, it, and that's perhaps consistent with our intuition that such operators shouldn't exist, that these theories are more like gravitational theories if you think of these as being UV completed in some non-standard way, whether by like self-healing or class localization or whatever you want to call it. These these, uh, if these theories are more like gravitational theories, we don't expect them to be true local field theories that have a spectrum of local operators. So that maybe these things don't exist, which means that the target for the conformal bootstrap is not gonna be correlators as it is for standard conformal field theory. It's, we have to try to target something else, but, but maybe this conformal symmetry will be useful for that. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll end there, thank you. Okay, Kurt, thanks a lot. So. Um... Yeah, if there's any questions, please feel free to raise your hand. So, yeah, I'm going to start with a very quick one. So mm -hmm. the way you presented it, it's natural to ask what happens in D equals minus four. Yeah. You sort of go, in D equals four, there's the exceptional theory is DBI special Galilean, and then it stops. Yeah. You might think that that this stops. Yeah. At D equals minus two. Did, did you look at that from like an algebraic point of view? Yeah, yeah. So I, th I think that's right. I think it does stop in the sense that the the algebra. So if you continue the pattern here of what the what this representation would have to be for d equals minus four, it would be a symmetric traceless rank three tensor. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at the algebras that that could satisfy, there is no nonlinear algebra that it could satisfy. So indeed, the algebra that you'd want just doesn't exist unless it's trivial. So the free scalar, in fact, has these symmetries at any minus even dimensional D. Yes, yeah, so I guess for the DBI and the special Gal Galilean, that their usual symmetries form a subalgebra. Right. right? So I thought there might be a case where when you add this, uh, this rank three symmetric guy, that it, it forms a consistent algebra, but not a subalgebra, right? When you add the, the conformal generators. But... Yeah, but I think it doesn't even form okay. a consistent algebra to begin with. Um, okay, and uh, Tangi, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, uh, first of all, thanks for the beautiful talk. It's really satisfying to, to get this geometric uh, picture behind these, uh, these symmetries. Uh, just in response, maybe David, I think, uh, I think for the rent three tensor, if you want to add the special conformal transformation, I think we showed, you showed in, in Enrico that the alpha the algebra just doesn't close, but maybe it's slightly different. Anyways, uh, my question, I have two questions. Um, one is about, uh, you, you, you said that these, uh, the vial transformations, the, the additional transformation um, form the, the same symmetries as the ADS uh, DBI and ADS Galilean. Um, 
what's the reason for this choice of uh, of sign and not the sitter? Is it is it related to the alpha coefficient if you change the oh. sign? Um, well, yeah. So it, it would just give you a different real form of the algebra if you go to mm -hmm. consider. I don't. I don't think it's the same as just changing alpha. Uh, but there's some like the, the sign of alpha and the signature of the space time. Yeah. Right, play into which group it is. But, mm -hmm. but it's always just some real form of of S O D plus two. Yeah. There's no there's no deep meaning behind why it's ADS or, or right, right. right. Yeah. All of this would go through for yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So, so Kurt, are there any um, contractions of these algebras for which the symmetry would be true for, for say, Galileans? Um, contraction, which if would I be true, I take oh, you mean it, as opposed to the special Galilean? Yes, yeah, so if I start with the, the algebra that DBI realizes in D equals four, and I take a contraction, I get the algebra of the Galileans. If uh -huh. I then get this extended algebra, is there a contraction mm -hmm. for which it's a symmetry ah. of Galileans in D equals zero? I see, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, presumably there is. The, the question is whether all these extra symmetries remain non-trivial in that contraction or whether they kind of split off and become trivial. But yeah, that's a good question. Um, Enrico, have you had them? Yes, but it's, it's very trivial. But then I thought I, I think it would be useful for me to understand uh, if you can say a few words more about the motivations to, to study these theories. I would imagine eventually you're probably interested in uh, finite D, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what is the intuition that you can compute things at finite D by using symmetries at D minus two? I mean, I could imagine I write a Lagrangian there are a bunch of terms proportional to D and a bunch of terms not. The right. ones that are not are symmetric, but the one with D are not symmetric, so. Yeah, that's a good question. So I know Cliff Chung in that paper, they argued that you could actually try to bootstrap the amplitudes just in D equals zero, that that would be enough to then kind of, if you know what form the D dependence takes, you can kind of reconstruct the D, D dependence from D equals zero. If you know it like can only appear in certain polynomials or something like that. So nice. I haven't, haven't tried to do that, but I don't see a priori why you couldn't. So the idea is that the d-dependence is some simple, I mean, because you can imagine yeah. there's a coefficient, d times a function that you don't know. When d is zero, you're yeah. good. Yeah, when that's it's right. not zero, you're screwed. That's right, yeah, that would be yeah. the obstruction, yeah. But I, I certainly, I haven't tried to. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. Alex? Uh, could, maybe you could show us this uh, action for DBI with curvature corrections? Oh, yeah. Uh, because they, they are a bit puzzled because, oh yeah, because it seems that the correction is linear in alpha. And for me, then it means that uh, this uh, operator with R menu demi phi demi phi uh, on the background of phi would change the propagation of gravitational waves, right? Uh, presumably, yeah. Well, and, I don't know, uh, because I mean, if I think the terms you usually certain. worry about are like Riemann type terms, so. Right. But you see, what is kind of uh, interesting there is that uh, disregarding the sign. So basically, this, I, I would guess if the sign is, uh, let's say, subluminal, uh, then maybe you would need, let's say, time derivatives. But if the sign is uh, superluminal, you would need um, just uh, special derivatives of, of phi. So basically, it seems that it doesn't matter which sign of alpha you pick. So whether you start from the superluminal DBI, which uh, we suggested with Slava or with normal DBI, uh, this correction would introduce superluminal gravitational waves. Just the question is on which type of background, right? Yeah, it's possible. I mean, usually I associate bad propagation of gravitational waves with like Riemann type terms that can't be eliminated by the lowest order equations. But when you have Ricci type terms like this, they can generally be move to higher order by using the lowest order Einstein equations. Uh, so I, I don't know that it's op, that it's obvious a priori that there's yeah, gravitational wave propagation. Yeah, that's of course, that's a good question because if you do it perturbatively, if you take, but I think if mm -hmm. you take this uh, term just, just as it is, right? And start calculating things and this changes definitely the anisotropic stress and you would have, you would have correction for the speed of sound. Mm -hmm. At least, you know, that's I know from, from the stuff we were doing with uh, Slava on this mimetic uh, uh -huh. stuff, and there were similar terms. 
and these terms do produce change in speed of propagation. Actually, uh -huh. if you want, it's a very similar term which you could get in, um, uh, in this Khajaba Lifshitz gravity. Uh -huh. And there it changes the speed of propagation for tensors too. And I think here it's the case as well. I see. Provided that there is no subtle, very, very subtle consolation with the second guy, this Armenu squared, but I don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. Thanks. It's a, not a question, it's a comment in some sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, let's see, uh, Lam. Yeah, Kurt, I have a question about this uh, non linearly realized. Uh, transformation that you show just want, want to get some intuition about what what they are um so the the, the one the, the ones that you show they take the form of you know um transformation on the field goes like there's a linear term in the field and then there's a quadratic term in the field yeah and um if i if i want to ask what field what special field configuration would be such that the total transformation is zero. Does that tell you anything useful or interesting? I mean, other than just the trivial other than equal the, zero transformation? That's right. What are, what are those field configurations? Um, I don't know if there are any. Yeah, I haven't tried to ask whether there's any, whether there's any conformally invariant field configurations other than a constant phi. I mean, for ordinary conformal symmetry, there isn't constant phi as the only conformal right. invariant one, so. Right. Yeah, so here there would be, yeah, there'd have to be some balancing between the linear and the nonlinear term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I guess as a- Well, but the, the scale transformation is still linear, so I, I wouldn't, it, the only thing invariant under the scales is again going to be a right. It, it will not be invariant under the full thing, but it will yeah. be invariant under part of the transformation. Thing. Yeah, but I don't think even that because we know that if we just get rid of the scale transformation, it no longer closes as a group. Right. So I think if it's invariant under the conformals, uh, it would also have to break Lorentz invariance to do something interesting. But yeah, maybe that's possible. If I can add a, a comment. Um, we, with David and Sarah, we studied uh, some theories around uh, Lorentz violating backgrounds uh, uh -huh. with, with additional symmetries. And we did find uh, a similar symmetry that is unbroken, but nonlinear in the field transformation. Oh, for, right. the, okay. for the special Galileon, uh, expanded around a specific uh, background. I see. In general dimension, though, you didn't have to. Uh, I think I think we worked in four dimensions. Okay. Um, don't remember if it's if it's valid for any dimension. But okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I guess it was a, a comment. There there are some backgrounds that create those symmetries. Okay, I'll have to look at that. Okay, so yeah, maybe I have one more quick question. So there's there's one more exceptional. EFT in four dimensions that you didn't mention, which is uh, Volkov Akulov for a massless spin spin one half. Oh yeah, interesting. So yeah, a very okay. similar structure to the the P of X and mm -hmm. DBI. So would you expect that to be conformally invariant in D equals zero? Yeah, very good question. Yeah, um, I don't see why not. Yeah, we should check that. That's yeah, presumably it's yeah. straightforward to check. And it has it has almost the same structure. Yeah, like that's right. Yeah. yeah, we could probably figure out what the group is. It pretty it's quick. Yeah, that's a good question. Is it and that's it, right? There's no like fermion ones beyond that that are exceptional. Yeah, that's the only uh, spin one half guy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Okay, so in terms of the timetable, we have three more minutes. If anyone wants to ask another quick question, or we can go to the break. Sorry, can I ask something really dumb? Yeah. yeah. Please. Yeah, um, so your alpha is a constant or would you allow it to be a function of phi? I want it to be a constant. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, now, if you made it a function of phi, can you still make use of the symmetries in some, you know, broken sense or? Yeah, I mean, as long as it's a function of phi in such like, like for the ADS DBI, where it's a specific function that comes from pulling back ADS, then then it would all go through in the, in the same way. Right. That's but if it's just some arbitrary function, then I don't think there's any 
symmetry there. To... Right, right, right. Um, but yeah, that's part of why I was confused because you connected to the ADS version, which for which alpha is you know the usual lambda over phi to the fourth. Right. Yeah. Um, so for that yeah, specific but, but function. You, but, but sorry, but but still alpha was constant instead of being the one over phi to the fourth in that situation. I, yeah, so if 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 it was one over phi to the fourth, I think everything I said would still go through. Mm -hmm. But for just an arbitrary function, it wouldn't. Okay, so so the ADS symmetry didn't depend on the one over phi to the fourth. In other words, I mean, it, somehow that was right. Yeah, I was just making a comment that the theory with the one over phi to the fourth in one higher dimension has the same symmetry breaking pattern as the constant alpha in in this lower dimension. Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so I think